Code time. Let's look into this whole Romex inside of electrical non-metallic tubing. Should we be putting Romex inside of ENT? Should we be putting this, uh, is this considered a wet environment? Like, is there really a code violation in this instance? Let's look at a couple of different places. So to find this, you're gonna have to look. Um, if I were out in the field and had my code book out, I would probably try to look in a few different locations first. The, the first and foremost, what I would be looking for searching through code is, okay, if I look up non-metallic sheath cable or Romex, does it say anything about installing it in wet locations, dry locations, and the like? So let's go over to 334 for non-metallic sheath cable types NM and NMC. Now this is type NM cable, this is not NMC. I know that for sure. So the first thing I do is I look around, there's uses permitted, it shows a whole bunch of things that you can do with it. Then I go to uses not permitted, which is 334.12, and I go down to B because that is type NM specifically. Type A is for NM and NMC. Type B applies in uh, excess of NMC to specifically just NM. Um, it says NM cable should not be used in the following conditions. Um, we're exposed to corrosive fumes, that doesn't apply. Where embedded in masonry, concrete, adobe, fill, or plaster, that could apply, but really it's inside of a conduit. It's not the actual Romex itself that is inside embedded into the, con the cement. Um, so that doesn't really apply. In a shallow chase in masonry, that doesn't apply. Um, or in wet or damp locations. Well, I think we could probably consider this a wet or damp location, being as we're looking at these conductors and they are both wet and damp. Um, but is the inside of a conduit considered a dry location because you're not getting water in? Most conduits though, if they go underground, uh, do get moist. A lot of water gets inside of conduits. Um, so you have to kind of look for conduits then. If we look in uh, article 100 under definitions, go to the L's uh, for locations. And dude, if you're watching this, open your code book. Like, this is the best way to learn code. You're on a job, you have a specific problem, you look up code. So pause this and look up all of this stuff in the code with me. All right, so we go to L's. That is where the damp, wet, and dry locations are. You can't go to the D to find dry location or W for wet. It's kind of stupid, but I get it. It's locations. So look for location damp. Uh, damp location is a location protected from weather and not subject to saturation with water or other liquids, but subject to moderate degrees of moisture. I would say that this environment in general, this, this masonry under this light where there's uh, there's a potential for water to get underneath of this. There's no weatherproof seal or anything. I would call this a damp location. Um, it's directly, you know, in, in where rain could be. Now the inside of the conduit itself, I don't know that you would classify that as a damp location. What about wet? Wet location says it's installations underground or in concrete slabs or masonry in direct contact with the earth in locations subject to saturation with water or other liquids such as vehicle washing areas and in unprotected locations exposed to weather. Okay, so I would say that this tubing in this specific instance is probably that. Now, they ran this tubing in the slab uh, most likely. Most likely they didn't do this after the masonry uh, was, the structure was actually built, you know, the, the rocks that everything is sitting on. Could be wrong, uh, I can't see that. But I know that the rock structure is a masonry structure on the slab. So I can assume that this is in a slab, even if it's not, it says, uh, or masonry in direct contact with the earth. Well, the slab, this masonry structure and everything, it's hard to classify, right? Like this masonry is not, in contact with the earth, but it, it's in contact with the slab. So we don't know, does it go through the slab or not? But I would call this environment, this situation, a very wet uh, or damp environment. So I would personally classify the inside of the conduit in this case 
a wet environment or at least a damp environment. Um, if it were in an attic somewhere and we were running through ENT and we had this Romex that was running through this ENT conduit, no, that's a dry location. It's not going to be exposed and in any way get moist. But when I open the fixtures, every single one of these conductor conductors at every one of the locations is wet. Therefore, I'm classifying it as a wet environment. So the other, the last thing that we can look in, uh, Article 300 is wiring methods and materials. So this is the general requirements for any kind of wiring methods or materials that you're going to put in. 300.5B, in underground installations, it says a wet location, the interior of enclosures or raceways installed underground shall be considered to be a wet location. Insulated conductors and cables installed in these enclosures or raceways in underground installations shall comply with 310.10C. So 310.10C, that goes into actual conductors. That's what 310 is. It just says that they have to be of a type listed for use in wet locations. So Romex, uh, NM, just standard NM, not NMC or, or any other variations of, of non-metallic sheath cable. NM is not a listed uh, conductor for wet environments. So that again, I mean, that's, it's a little ambiguous, right? The, like the, we're not underground. This conduit doesn't go underground. We don't know. It might go underground. It might go into the slab. Um, but it's definitely wet. <laughs> so uh, the other thing to do, I guess, to get around this is maybe you could just like silicone and put some waterproofing and things like that. If it isn't an underground tubing, if it is just going through the masonry and it's not in contact with the earth, then I guess you could get away with calling it a dry location on the inside of this tubing. But I just thought that that was an interesting kind of issue. Sometimes code is a little ambiguous and trying to figure out well, can I do this or can I not? It's a, a lot of it's up to interpretation. And a lot of times there's extra books. There's like handbooks that you can buy that have extra bits of interpretation. And then there's all these code gurus and people that are on the code making panel that have their own books that they make, how they interpret code differently. And then you've got local uh, authorities like AHJs, cities, inspectors, that it's their, ins their uh, inspectors or their jurisdictions um, decision making. It's up to them to interpret how this code reads. So there's some stuff that you can't really find an exact answer to. Um, but in this instance, I notice all of these conductors are getting wet. So I think just the decision to use Romex, knowing that it is not a conductor that's okay to be run in wet environments, even if this were a dry environment on the inside of this conduit, just knowing that there's a possibility of it getting wet, I wouldn't have run these conductors. I would have run uh, THHN or some kind of weatherproof listed, uh, um, like conductor that's listed for a wet environment. <laughs>314.27C, boxes at ceiling suspended paddle fan outlets. So an outlet box or outlet box system used as the sole support of a ceiling suspended paddle fan shall be listed, shall be marked by the manufacturer as suitable for this purpose and shall not support ceiling suspended paddle fans that weigh more than 70 pounds. So a lot of different fans that you're gonna install get hung a lot of different ways. Sometimes they have to be hung from big metal beams. Sometimes the fan's 300 damn pounds. There's a lot of like big cast iron, huge steel fans. And there's just like cheap stuff like in here. You guys don't even see, but there's actually a fan above me. I'm just really clever with my angles. So you don't see it, but it's like some cheap crappy fan, you know? So the actual box, this thing probably weighs like I don't know, 10 pounds maybe. So there's no problem with the box itself holding the weight of that fan. But if we get up to like a hundred pound fan and you've just got this little metal box with some little tiny screws holding this thing in the ceiling and you start adding circular motion, the likelihood of that fan falling out of the ceiling increases, especially if you're talking plastic boxes. If you're gonna be putting like screws into a plastic box, trying to hold a 100 pound fan, ain't happening, Kapanen. So we have to go into code to know 
what to do. And it says you need your boxes to actually be listed. So a lot of times you have specific fan braces. They are listed for use for suspending fans from them and holding a certain amount of weight. Sometimes you have fan cakes, which are fan rated pancakes, same kind of thing. Can't use just a regular pancake. You have to use a fan rated pancake because it is rated for the weight of that fan. So what else does it say in here? Um, for outlet boxes or outlet box systems designed to support ceiling suspended paddle fans that weigh more than 35 pounds, the required marking shall include the maximum weight to be supported. So if you're gonna be over 35 pound fan, which is a pretty damn heavy fan, to be honest, um, it needs to be actually listed for what the total amount of weight is that can be supported. Now there's a couple of new additions for this code. Uh, it says outlet boxes mounted in the ceilings of habitable rooms of dwelling occupancies in a location acceptable for the installation of ceiling suspended paddle fans shall comply with one of the following. One, it has to be listed for the sole support of ceiling suspended paddle fans. You can't use some box that's not listed for fans. Two, an outlet box complying with the applicable requirements of 314.27 and providing access to structural framing capability of supporting of a ceiling suspended paddle fan bracket or equivalent. So basically, use a fan box. Don't use like some crazy old box. Don't be using plastic boxes, especially not the old work kind of boxes or like the really, really old boxes that you find in like 1960s homes and you think you can just drive a screw through it or put, you know, it's like some random screw on the, the, the ground that you found. It's really important to use stuff that is listed. So on that note, let's look and see what it says in the National Electric Code for splices and junction boxes and stuff like that. 314.29. Boxes, conduit bodies, and handhold enclosures shall be installed so that wiring contained in them can be rendered accessible in accordance with 314.29 A and B. Now under A, it says in buildings and other structures. That's us. We're in a structure and a building says boxes and conduit bodies shall be installed so the contained wiring can be accessed without removing any part of the building or structure without having to cut a fucking hole in the ceiling <laughs> so the last electrician did not do it to code they didn't make all of this stuff accessible and it needs to be accessible <laughs> Now, if you notice the receptacle that I'm about to put in is a WRTR receptacle, which means that it is weather resistant and tamper resistant. So per code, if we open up our handy dandy code book and we go to receptacles, which would be 406, receptacles, cord connectors, and attachment plugs. In 406, you're going to find a reference 406.4D6 where it says weather resistant receptacles. Weather resistant receptacles shall be provided where replacements are made at receptacle outlets that are required to be so protected elsewhere in this code. So as code likes to do, directs you from one place in the code to another place in code to find the information rather than just giving it to you. So if we move forward a little bit in the same article, we have 406.9 receptacles in damp or wet locations. Now it's up in the air a little bit, whether or not we're in a wet or a dampened location. I say we're in both, you know, we're out on a boat dock. So like waves coming in, if like boats drive by, it could splash and get all over the place. Um, typically though, that's probably not going to happen in a damp location. Anything that has an awning that's underneath an awning, that's not going to be directly rained on is essentially a damp location, but anything that, you know, could have like rain beating on it, water beating on it is considered a wet location. So it's arguable at least that this plug could be in both. If we look at the definitions um, in 406.9a under damp locations, the third paragraph says, a receptacle shall be considered in a location protected from the weather. We're located under roofed open porches, canopies, marquees, and the like, and will not be subject to beating rain or water runoff. That is what they consider a damp location. Now a wet location, they don't actually give you a proper uh, definition, but they do talk about it being uh, weatherproof. So in wet locations under uh, 406.9b, it says receptacles of 15 and 20 amp, 125 and 250 volts installed in a wet location shall have an enclosure that is weatherproof, whether or not the attachment cap is inserted. So if we go back to the beginning of the book in article 100, there are definitions for weatherproof 
and I believe weather tight, water tight. Uh, weatherproof, it says in 100, uh, constructed or protected so that exposure to the weather will not interfere with the successful operation. So again, it's kind of arguable either way, but I'm using a WRTR because uh, either way, this is a wet and a damp location. That is what I'm considering this environment. Now, the other part of that, I said it was a WRTR receptacle. The TR is for tamper resistant. Uh, tamper resistant receptacles are covered in 406.12. It says all 15 and 20 amp, 125 and 250 volt non-locking type receptacles in the area specified in one through eight of 406.12 shall be listed tamper resistant. It says dwelling units including attached and detached garages and accessory buildings, uh, two dwelling units and common areas of multifamily dwellings. So this is kind of an accessory building, building to a dwelling unit. So I'm using a TR receptacle for this building.